Hello, Akeen. Uh, welcome to Steak Podcast. Uh, I'll have already done an introduction by the time that this starts showing. Uh, thank you for your time. I am very familiar with you. A lot of the people listening to this are probably very familiar with you. And so I want to make sure that what we're doing with this time is focusing on a lot of things around uh, your thinking right now, what you're doing with your company, and also around your thoughts around Decred and the space in general. So very briefly for everyone, maybe you could just tell us, you know, where you're from, where you went to school, your you know, professional career up to now. And uh, yeah, I'll just hand it over to you. Sure. Um, so I was born in Massachusetts. I, um, but I spent my first 16, 17 years growing up in Nigeria. Um, I moved back to the U.S. for college. I got a degree in economics from a small liberal arts school called Union College in upstate New York, Schenectady. Um, and then I moved down to D.C. <clears throat> and my first job was with the International Monetary Fund. So like doing international development finance, um, did that for a couple of years. And then I spent a year at Freddie Mac doing, um, Freddie Mac is kind of like secondary mortgage finance, like structured finance, but I was focused more on um, sort of like, you know, business and client side work, as well as almost in a PM role, like managing a lot of um, technology, like development within Fannie Mae, or sorry, within Freddie Mac. Um, so I spent about a year there, then I went to business school at Dartmouth, came back down to DC again, and then spent uh, almost 15 years doing management consulting with um, Accenture, it was Alan Hamilton. Um, and then, you know, I got into like FinTech in Africa. Um, I, I had the opportunity to invest in a mobile payments company in Sierra Leone. And, you know, from there, spent a couple of years like just as a board member and, you know, started a consulting firm. My consultancy fell and then focused on just kind of helping startups in the FinTech space. Everywhere from, you know, just advisory governance, helping them think about structuring their businesses, you know, some fundraising. Um, and that's kind of what led me into crypto because I was trying to figure out if we could use crypto, you know, blockchains to basically solve remittances. Right. So, you know, Nigeria as a country, depending on what stat you look at, you know, brings in between $25 billion and $40 billion a year from the diaspora, like literally just remittances going home. And still a very, very inefficient market. It's typically very expensive for people to remit money to sub-Saharan Africa. Um, just because of some regulation, some of it is anti-competitive, the anti-competitive nature of the space where incumbents have a very strong foothold. And so that kind of got me into like thinking about crypto, like how can we use crypto? How can we use blockchains to solve remittances? And, you know, I just kind of went down the rabbit hole. So, you know, from there, started thinking a lot about, you know, how these networks are governed, you know, what's the governance structure, why is that important, um, you know, how are they going to evolve over time, like how do you manage this permission, like these permissionless networks as they grow and scale and not run into like, you know, just issues and challenges, right? Like we've never been at a, I don't think we've been at a point in history where you have permissionless access to these, what I consider like economies, um, or marketplaces, um, you've, you've never had that where anyone can be a member or be a, be a contributor or, you know, add value to a network. And, and so I was very just curious about how, what governance would look like, you know, how it manifests and how it evolves. Um, and that's kind of what attracted me into Decred because at the time, you know, Decred was really on the forefront of thinking about explicitly about, you know, on-chain and off-chain governance, and how do you make the game fair, right? How do you make the rules pretty clear? How do you kind of attract people that are aligned with that kind of philosophy and constitution that they want to contribute and they want to be compensated fairly and equitably, right? So that's kind of how I got into Decred. Um, and it's been an area of, you know, governance has been an area that's just been of interest to me, even as I've, you know, continued to get involved with other projects and you know, the DeFi space and other things going on. So that interest in governance, is that just from a, does that come from just a very intellectual pursuit or does that come from something else? So, I mean, so my background is in, I mean, you know, I was an econ major, right? So I always think about things based on, you know, economics concepts, right? 
why do firms get together? You know, what's the purpose of the marketplace, right? Um, um, you know, generally, you know, the theory of the firm basically says, you know, firms are just like efficient ways to organize, right? So when, you know, when you're in an efficient market where information is hard to acquire, where, you know, you're in a repeated game, right? So an employee is in a repeated game where I work for a company and I do a set of tasks and responsibilities over and over again. And it's a lot cheaper for, for the company to have a long-term contract or job with me than for the company to hire someone for every project right? Because there's going to be an acquisitions cost of hiring people over and over again, which is why like, you know, post-World War II, people stayed in one company for their whole career because it guaranteed them employment and guaranteed them a good life. And there are all these guarantees that came along with that and there was security, right? And, you know, everyone wants some level of security. Um, but as, you know, when you think about like the evolution of the internet and how that kind of broke down walls to communication, and now we're into cryptocurrencies where it's not just about communications, but you can transfer value, right? And you can do that in a very provably fair way, right? You can see transactions on chain. You can see and know that, you know, the software behaves the same way over and over again, right? You can, right, that creates a dynamic where now there's a shift from having to work for a firm or the firm as the major coordinator of economic activity. And the balance is now shifting back to the marketplace, where I, as an individual contributor, if I choose, I can work for one project, multiple projects, but as long as there's a recognition in that marketplace that I can add value, and it's easy to discover the value I can add, and I can be compensated for it, then all of a sudden, like, it's tipping the balance, right? And it's making it easier for people to interact, you know, in the economies or in multiple marketplaces based on the merits of their contribution. Right, because it's it's less there's less of a bias, I'd like to say, in software, right? At least in protocols, money protocols and, and so for me it's that, that's that's a lot of the background, right? Into how I started thinking about these networks and why I was curious as to in a practical way, how does that manifest? Right? Because you know, we're we're trying you know, we're trying to build these networks as we go. And so you can have all this theory, but it'll manifest its, its itself in different ways as you know, you still have to interact with people. You still have to sort of think about how you manage relationships. Yeah, it's not. I, mean, I like what you said there because I th I think that that very much speaks to Decred in a specific way, and that how the software is you know communicating with the users in terms of the UI UX and and also being able to te tell a narrative. And I'm sure you've before we jump into Decred, I do want to just rewind to. You know, it was remittances you said that initially drew you to the cryptocurrency industry. And was there kind of this aha moment with um, some, there, there's always an aha moment, but can you talk to us about that aha moment um, that you must have had with Bitcoin at some moment? And then when the aha moment came with Decred as well, and what was that initial aha? Well, so, you know, so I dabbled in Bitcoin and Ethereum initially as risk assets, right? So I used to trade stocks a lot. I traded some options just, you know, coming through college. I remember the first stock I ever bought, I went, you know, I went to Smith Barney, like a physical, it used to be called Smith Barney back then before they're independent. And I paid like $60 in commissions to buy $300 worth of stock. I'll never forget that. It was like 1996, I think. That's crazy. <laughs> right. And right. But it was like, Oh, okay. That's cool. Right. That's some way to transact. And over time, I got out of college, E-Trade, electronic systems. So it became easier to trade for like, you know, seven bucks a transaction. Right. So when, when, when Bitcoin and Ether started getting traded on Coinbase, it was just a sort of like risk asset. Like I didn't really understand it, but I just kind of had a peripheral view that this was sort of like internet money and right. Um, and then I really started getting into it again, as I said, when I realized, oh, okay, blockchain can be used for other things, right? It's really a communications it's like a value communication protocol, like a way to move value, right, in a fair way. And, you know, that's, that was the first aha moment. It was like, okay, this is a lot more than... And let me interrupt you, know. you right there, just because value, you... Initially, it's the value is Bitcoin being used as a form of money, but you have a lot more wide view of this in terms of other forms of value as well, correct? Of course. Exactly, right? So speak to and so that's what leads one... Yeah, so that, that's a natural lead into like Decred, right? Because 
Decode is now sort of a marketplace where it wasn't just about the financial value, like that undergirds the system, but it's also like a much more sophisticated way for what I consider like more sophisticated interactions. All right, so Decred, the way I always saw it was, what, sure, you need hard money and you need this idea of assurances and security, but Decred, more than any project at the time that I'd seen, was more of a value transfer marketplace, right? So you have miners who are providing value and getting paid for securing the network, right? You have stakers who are essentially buying value, staking it and locking it up, and that gives them access to, you know, some of the fees that are generated by the network, some of the inflation. Um, but it also gives you rights to vote and to be involved in decision-making process, right? And that innovation was a big deal because it was like, oh, wow, like not only can you be part of a financial marketplace, you could actually have a role in influencing how that market develops, right? And so, so that's another piece. And then a third you know, or consider like a fourth piece, which is not always that explicit, is the fact that you can contribute to the building of that network and get compensated, right? So the way like most people join Decred as contributors, you tend to be part of the community and it evolves over time, right? Yeah. And and so that leaves as a pathway, even though it's, you know, it could be a little bit amorphous, but it's a pathway to like giving time, giving effort, giving your intellectual um, property, right, for a return, right? And it just is fair, right? And I think, it, it, to me, it fixed a lot of things around Bitcoin development, right? So, well, how do you contribute to Bitcoin? How do you get paid? Like, how are developers paid? Like, all those, like, questions are always sort of like, who's funding what projects, right? Um, at least, regardless of what you'd say about the structure of Decred, at least it's transparent, right? Or it's and it's getting more and more transparent as it gets more and more decentralized. And to me, that was like, okay, now that's the first time I, I saw cryptocurrencies and these networks as really marketplaces that had all the you know, dynamics of marketplaces, not just about just initial value transfer, but everything around game theory, how you interact with people, how you align incentives, right? It's almost like you're building the sort of like new primitives for how marketplaces function or could function into the future. Um, so that was very kind of like, okay, it kind of like, you know, expanded the field or the, the scope of opportunities a, a lot more. So I, I really like those three different, or maybe it was about four different things that you said where you saw Decred started iterating and, you know, started creating like these new marketplace opportunities almost, I think is a, a good way to kind of summarize it. But I yeah. also noticed you said there, um, at the time, you use the keywords at the time. And so that implies that your thinking in the space has also evolved. And I, if actually, if I being a hundred percent forthright, I believe in something I've heard you say at one time, you have a, a critique of Decred um, as well. And so hopefully later in the, in the talk, we can talk about that as well. Um, but I wanna get more into how you've been thinking about the space now, right? Because we are in a new era um, yep. and um, so DeFi, um, you know, yearn, I think to me, YFI was probably a really aha moment for me, um, and started seeing a lot of that, how DeFi is playing out. Um, and you even see Checkmate, I think has kind of started talking about a little bit more that mm -hmm. like, there's something about mind share here in market capture and yes, Decred does have a lot of, like you said, those fundamentals, like the hard money aspect. And I believe, I don't know how much you've kept up with, uh, um, you know, how much you've kept up with production of Decred, but this newest release with the Atomic Swap um, D DCR Dex, I believe is a very, very monumentous time in the protocol's history um, and the decentralized treasury as well. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about where you're thinking about things now. Yeah, so I think... So, I mean, to that point you raised, I think it's, we're kind of like an inflection point and in a lot of projects, right? So not across DeFi with Decred, like we're at a point in the marketplace where a lot of the, the tools or a lot of the features you need to have are now readily available, right? So what I mean by that is if you think about the pathway Decred has taken, 
It's been, you know, building the ways for the community to interact, building assurances around the currency, building privacy and rolling out implementation. Right, the DEX has been in production, has been, you know, it's been a while, it's been worked on, it's now released. So if you think about like the suite of products that have come out of Decred, it's like, it's like a singular stack that you sort of almost have like a complete set of tools that allows, you know, like sovereign individuals, right? An individual to like interact in the space privately, have value transfer, contribute value, like the infrastructure is there, right? Now, at the same time, right, in parallel, you have other, no, nothing else is standing still, right? So you have the Ethereum ecosystem just blowing up with DeFi, right? And this idea of composability and, you know, you've had projects that over the last couple of years have gone through governance issues and, and there still are, right? And are beginning to value that a lot more such that, you know, you have literally you know, everyone thinking about governance right up front. Like that was an issue that we talked about in Decred like a year, year and a half ago. You know, this, this idea that governance has to be explicit and it's got to be set up like literally up front. And that's a thing that is becoming commonplace across the market because people now see the value in being transparent up front, right? And the products that we've seen that have had these spectacular like rises and, you know, and failures in short periods of time have typically failed around two vectors, right? Governance, right? And, um, well, I think it's one vector, but the second vector manifests itself in sort of like code vulnerabilities, right? But I think that's an aspect of governance too. Because if your government says that, look, we're gonna build, um, you know, market ready product, we're gonna go through audit processes, we're gonna go through like the software development life cycle, like, a Microsoft Word, for example. Like, am I going to put out code that is like, just so buggy or so bad where, especially when you're dealing with protocols that are money protocols, right? It's not just like, oh, the software didn't work and like I lost my file I was typing into, but it's like people are losing money, right? So the, the threshold of even like acceptability should even be higher, right? Um, and, and so we're seeing, right, in the marketplace where there's now like a bifurcation, right? You can, you can clearly tell like who's thinking about governance? You can see that governance is valuable and you're also seeing like failures of governance and what the impacts are, right? And, and so I still have to say that a lot of the things I think Decred has led on and was early on are becoming more and more like commonplace in the market, especially in the market where the rest of the market is experimenting in so many models, right? So many ways and a lot will fail, but a lot will be successful too, right? For whatever that need and purpose is. And I think the risk that, you know, Decred runs is being too insular, right? And kind of building towards a vision where it's a good vision, but you can't ignore what's going on in the market, right? And you can also ignore things like, you know, collaboration as a main vector. Like, okay, if you, you know, the one thing that Ethereum ecosystem has with all the criticisms is people just collaborate. It's like a natural cultural order, right? Composability, I build on what you build. Oh, interesting. Uh, you can see, like, you know, Synthetics built a very, very complex, it's a project, I don't know if you're familiar with Synthetics, but they're a synthetic protocol on Ethereum. And they built a, you know, a very complex um, smart contract to kind of, basically that's a primitive for yield farming, right? Yeah. yeah. A way, and lots of projects just literally just copy and paste that. They use it, right? Because it's just so, such a well-built piece of software but the difference now is because it was openly accessible and that, you know, if I was another protocol that used it, I could talk to synthetics, I could interact in the ecosystem. You now see how like, you know, that piece of software is not only valuable for the whole ecosystem, but tracks back to synthetics too. Because even if it's just from a standpoint of everyone's using something you built, but it creates a way for synthetics to basically extend itself, right? Like if someone builds something kind of cool that is you know, can be an additive to, to synthetics, then it behooves them to kind of interact and work with each other. And if you think about where synthetics is in its life cycle, there are now platforms and new projects that are basically funding themselves and building on top of synthetics, right? And, and so I think that's where I think we're, we're sort of back to an opportunity with the DEX and what's going on in the Decred where there's a new opportunity to leverage that to be a lot more open 
and to sort of like, you know, engage in the world, you know, from a standpoint of... Side of Decred is kind of what you're getting at, right? Yeah, like, I mean, with developers, with, you know, we have a lot of the tools, right? Like, I, I was having a conversation this week, and I'm like, you know, Decred had a, has had a lot of the tools to essentially be a big player in DeFi for a while, right? And the things that, I, in my view, that have stopped that are um, the lack of enough diversity rising to the top, right? Enough diversity in terms of participation. So it's interesting. I'm going to interrupt here just because yeah. I, um, I don't know if you've seen recently, Checkmate has been talking about, he put out a poll where he asked, should we do another airdrop? And I'm not going to speak for him, but one of my main takeaways from his asking of this question and thinking about well, maybe the Decred community needs to use part of the treasury to do an airdrop to other people to get people in is essentially an incentive, a slight incentive misalignment, right? Because it's all about the incentives in that he was saying people who buy Decred and bought Decred, um, they are they're, sometimes they're early on incentivized to not speak about it until um, they've sort of acquired enough of it. And um I say all that just to say, what are your thoughts about, and he also was talking about attracting developers. So what are your thoughts around uh, um, using the airdrop to do those two things, bring people in and attract developers? So I think it's, 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 it's trying to solve a problem that in my view, what is the wrong mechanism, right? Because if you think about, if you, if you do a new airdrop, then how do you actually do that in such a way that, current holders will see it as fair, right? So the current holders got a portion, like what's the ratio, the new people, like, like to me, it's kind of like, I can see the merits of that, but I also think that that's not the way I'd go about it. And you're, you're trying to like, you're trying to solve or get to a certain end and you're kind of going to create other problems, right? I think the issue is more around how do you foster a culture that is attractive to other people to want to come to participate? Right, so, you know, it's one thing having a DEX, for example, right? The DEX is a great opportunity because now, potentially, like Bitcoin holders can participate and opt into the Decred governance process, right? Because now you can swap, you know, um, Bitcoin for DCR, you can earn a yield by staking, quote unquote. You can participate in governance, right? By bringing your money and influencing and getting access to the treasury and building things. Like, it could be an interesting way for, you know, Bitcoin and Litecoin holders to kind of now say, oh, okay, I can participate in this decredit economy by buying into it, right? That's great, but that's not, to me, that's not good enough in that they still have to meet a culture that's willing to accept them and say, yeah, well, I'm coming with my Litecoin, I'm, I'm buying tickets, and I have a viewpoint on what we should go build. And they're not met by a community or stakeholders that are like, no, we don't want to. We don't have. We don't, you know, we don't want to hear what you have to say. Like this is the vision. Like you're bringing something in that kind of, you know, cuts or derails that. Because at the end of the day, it's an open protocol, right? What we're trying to build is something that where the game is fair and anyone can come in and play that game like everyone else, right? But if culturally there's a grind, right? There's this sort of attitude um, of you know we have our way or we have some sort of a complex because maybe some projects had you know governance issues or like, you know, everyone, everyone has something, right? But if the attitude is that we have a superiority complex then people will notice that and people will come and go. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I think, and, and to me, that's, 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 that's the, that's a huge thing that has to be overcome because no airdrop is going to overcome that. Right. People, you'll airdrop tokens to people, they'll show up, they'll be like, I don't know if I want to stay here and they'll dump it and leave. Uh, it's funny you say that because that's something that I, think the insularness of the community has only kind of struck in me as I've been more into staked podcast. Um, and it gets back to like kind of the, that the, one of the main critiques of the space um, from Rao Paul is that it's very tribalistic and it just gets back to human nature. Right. And I like yeah. your critique of insularness is a truthful one. And I think correct. I believe that, like you said, with Checkmate, he's, he's trying to solve a problem, but the mechanism's not correct. I voted no on his Twitter poll, but that's just full disclosure. Um, <laughs> but anyways, fine. I do want to talk about integration, right? Because I've been thinking about, you know, 
one thing you said that's good about the Ethereum community is that they're so collaborative and working together. I, I believe you said that, correct? I don't want to speak for you. So, like integration. So, I think. Um, so, is your question more around like mechanically how that would work, or like is it why? No, why is it no, no. The question, I'll, and I'll pose it open endedly. But I've been thinking a lot, or you've got me thinking a lot about getting Decred involved in some of the things like uh, the lending protocols, like Cream or uh, Compound or a YFI Volts or something like that. Um, in trying to work because you said there is a lot of foundations in decred and i i don't know um i think what i'm trying to get at is what ways do you think that the community can start trying to integrate with other aspects of the um ecosystem as a whole yeah so i think what you're kind of kind of tapping into is this idea of and i've had some conversations around this as you know decred as collateral right or cryptocurrency as collateral Right now, I think that that's a huge opportunity, right? I think there's an opportunity for Decred to be involved or people that have Decred to be involved in DeFi on Ethereum, for example, right? So there are protocols like REN that are bridging Bitcoin onto Ethereum, right? Where you can swap your Bitcoin for REN BTC. It's an ERC-20 token that's secured by a virtual machine. And you could basically now lodge that REN BTC in you know, LP vaults and whatever, get a yield. You can convert it to ether. Like you can play in that economy, right? Um, in any way you want. And you can literally have a simple way to like move in and out of that economy with your value. That opens up to me the landscape of potential holders of Decred. Because if I come in saying I love Decred, I'd love to have some tickets secure in the network, but I'd love to take some of my value and go like play in another economy, get some yield, come back, harvest, whatever. Like it just creates so many more options for use of the token that the net benefit to Decred is a bigger economy, right? Because people now show up saying, I'm coming in because I can participate, I can be involved in governance, um, I can hold a hard asset, but it also have, I also have the optionality of not having to exit that asset to play elsewhere. Right? I can just literally like, you know, have easy way. And to me, that's a huge opportunity because I think that's partially the opportunity of the DEX, right? It now poses a way that you can have has built something that I think if it stands on its alone, it can be, it, it's, it'll be limited, right? There needs, to be, there needs to be ways to kind of reach out to other communities, figure out to build bridges with like protocols like REN, for example, where people can use their Decred and, and, and yield farm. People can um, come in from other ecosystems, for example, and maybe people who have Ethereum have a way to bridge um, using REN to get access to Decred and to be able to like buy tickets and vote. Like just this idea of inter operating with other networks. And I think it really starts with, you have to appeal to developers. Yeah, right? yeah you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. right? And, you, and you have to, and that's a good starting point. And you have to be open to, to me, actively courting people. Like, so I think there was a time when it was almost easier to say, I'll build it and they will come. But I think the crypto market is so much more competitive uh, and it's growing so fast that the average person has a lot more options and you can determine where they get the best return for their time. And so if Decred isn't actively trying to court communities, actually trying to figure out how we can use some of the treasury, for example, to encourage people to figure out, for example, fork Politea or build on Politea, right? And use that as a governance system, right? Not just a tool, but we have like over a year, almost a couple of years of Politea being live, right? We've learned lessons about what works, what doesn't. Like we've built from just straight proposals to having an RFP system, which just got introduced, right? The, the things and upgrades and learnings that are, you know, community, what I consider as community intellectual prop capital that need to be shared with other communities as a way to bring them in, right? Um, and like, I mean, a couple of months, a few, like, I mean, sometime last year, Zcash went through this big governance brouhaha. You know, that to me would have been an interesting opportunity. I mean, imagine Zcash building and forking, forking Politea, um, and now basically like anchoring the governance process and hashing it to like Decred blocks. Like that would have been fantastic. To me, that would have been like the best way to market what we're doing to the outside crypto space and say, hey, come and build on, on our platforms, right? So that's me some level of being proactive because we're at the point, I think, in the crypto space where good tech is, the best tech is not gonna win. 
right? It's the best tech plus the best community plus good, you know, acquisition strategy. Right? You got to think holistically. Like it's the same way companies have to have great tech, great marketing, great strategy, like, you know, and, and have a go to market strategy that's more inclusive. And I think, um, that to me is the opportunity, right? That to me is building those bridges is, is, is really critical because others are building it now. And, you know, six months from now, a year from now, the landscape will look very different. The landscape will be a lot more interconnected. And if Decred is an island sitting on its own, it'll become more and more, in my view, a great place to visit, but not a, lot, not a place a lot of people will be able to come, right? Because there's not enough bridges, there's not enough roads, there's not enough access points. Um, and so for me, that's kind of like the opportunity and sort of like the caution of what, you know, could potentially happen. No, I, I think that's um, very valuable, actually, just for the, co- the, the community to be hearing this, because it makes me think like, I mean, we have the mechanisms to do this. Like you said, this isn't and we are at this kind of critical juncture. Um, I want to make a quick diversion and then come back to Decrit again. And this quick diversion, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you see as exciting right now in the space and, and, and new and, and what you've been thinking about and, and looking at. Um, personally, I, I'll tell you, um, I've been over this last bear market, things like such as Decentraland have excited me, things such as Numeray. I think YFI was a, a turning moment for me. Um, I'm just interested to see what, what you're thinking about and what's exciting you. Yeah, so I mean, I'm really excited about DeFi as a, as a sort of what I kind of term as an emerging sector of crypto. Um, because it's just, it's, to me, at least in my mind, it's very clear what's happening in that, you know, traditional finance has a lot of things that are just, how I put it, like, there's so many things that we can build in crypto and DeFi that are so much better than how they exist today in the real world, right? Um, everything from, access, you know, having fair money to it's permissionless and people can come in and participate to you can verify information on chain. Um, you can create composable financial assets that will just be cheaper to access, right? You don't have to, I don't have to go into a, you know, a structured finance shop and Wall Street to say, go build me this financial product and pay you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like a protocol can compose that. And literally, you, you, you can literally just lodge permissionlessly assets to that and get a return. Like that alone, right, cuts so many, takes so much cost out of the system, right? And I think basically like the protocol becomes the bank, right? The protocol becomes the institution and then market players can come in with their money, with their asset, with their store of value, whatever they love, and they can come and play like everyone else, right? And you can hear you, know, like some people will play like at a low level where they're integrated at the contract level, they're building these complex you know, models um, that become their intellectual capital, like strategies that like a hedge fund would have, for example, and they can come to the space and just have their proprietary strategies. That's fine. Like come and play with whatever tools you have. Some folks who just literally have an app that someone builds as just kind of like wallets, like put money here, put money there, get a return, right? That might be how some people will only, some people like the vast mass market will probably only access crypto in a very nice UI, UX, app on their phone and never touch you know a, 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 an ethereum address or crypto address but it's like i can bring my dollars i can get a stable coin and i can get a yield and i can get a better yield i can get in my bank account it might be someone's use case right and so for me like the diversity of opportunity right in terms of what people are building how they're building it how they're creating different access points for different users um to me it's incredible right and i think it's so it's, it's been interesting to see how the market has evolved, particularly this year, and what the potential is, especially with what's going on in the formal economy, where there's high inflation everywhere, people are losing trust in central banks, right? Fear of inflation is coming, asset, asset values are inflating fast. Like a lot of people who are holding dollars who are kind of like scratching their heads and thinking, 
like, what's a dollar going to be worth in five years? And do I want to kind of hitch my wagon to like this fiat currencies when, you know, on a risk adjusted basis, I can get yield in DeFi. Like, how do I do, how do I play in that space? Like, I'm, I bet you lots of financial institutions are asking themselves those questions, especially in light of, you know, the recent news with um, PayPal getting to the space with, you know, listed companies investing in Bitcoin, MicroStrategy, Square, with Grayscale, Bitcoin Trust just going parabolic. You know, it's crazy. Like, it, the interest is, is clearly there, right? And I think it's, it's very interesting to see how the market's coming and how there's a lot more money going into the space. So some slight connection issues. We're just going to wait and I'll probably edit this out. Okay, we're back. The last thing you said was GBTC the interest is clearly there a lot of money coming into the space yeah so yeah that was not too far off. so like so basically i think you know there's a lot of activity there's a lot of interest there's clearly a lot of utility value and you know anyone who's in crypto needs to kind of take pay attention to that and figure out what it means for what you're building and you know what solutions you're trying to solve because I think you'll find that there are lots of like parallels to what we're trying to do, for example, with, with Decred um, and what's going on in DeFi, right? And how, how collaboration and building bridges kind of ends up at the same place, right? We're really trying to solve like high level, the same problems. Um, so why not kind of work together to do that? I think this is um, very important for the community to be hearing. And we have about 20 more minutes before we end the podcast and during that or with that time i want to turn it over to the community who has asked a, a few questions i just want to make sure that i get to that and then if we answer all those i will move on but give me one second as i pull them up okay this question comes from dr bitcoin he says now that the dcr dex has rolled out What's the next best step to continue to build out a true DeFi on the Decred network? Would it include Lightning? Question mark. Um, yeah, I think so. Like, so I think that you know the promise of Lightning has been coming for a long time and has sort of been underwhelming. And I think Decred's implementation of Lightning Lightning Network, when you marry it with the Dex creates an interesting opportunity, right? Because you now have a way to swap between currencies and then a fast way to transact, right? That's scalable. So I think the potential promise of Lightning, if it's gonna be what we thought it was gonna be, like it'll, in my view, it'll be on Decred, right? It'll be based on the suite of assurances you have um, in the Decred ecosystem. And if Decred is successful, then I think Bitcoin will come to the DEX, Lightning will come to the, like you'll get more people voting with their money and coming to use those tools. Um, and so how, are, how, we, how we do that is really now the key. Like how do we engineer and attract people to come in? How do we make sure there are more dev teams coming in and people integrating? How do we see, for example, potentially integrating with REN that's also doing interoperability, right? And maybe accessing certain points that we might not be able to access with the DEX in and of itself. Right. I think that in my view is kind of like the opportunity and it's those things we should be doing. And I think we're great at creating kind of like the primitives that make a marketplace, but now we have to be great at like attracting people to that market and letting them just kind of, you know, shop around and build what they want. And maybe, maybe kind of take our hands off a little bit on controlling, you know, controlling every aspect of development and how things need to go. I think we're at a point now where we've built enough, where the focus should be on, all right, how do we leverage a treasury to now integrate third parties, 
encourage users to come and build, right? So do we subsidize the cost? You know, how do we encourage people to come up and essentially like, you know, put in proposals and use Polyterium more and more and release funding and, you know, get multiple streams of products working at the same time. Like, I think it's now time to sort of maximize the utility of those assets that have been built that in my view have been underutilized, right? Um, particularly, I think the treasury and Polyterium. No, I agree with everything you said there. I, th I think we need to be looking more towards bringing in developers, integrating with other projects in the space. Um, I'll have to look more into to Ren. I, I've definitely heard, um, and and but I, if that's something that we can start doing, like we need to start doing it. But I think that, um, yeah, as a community, we need to start looking more outwards as well in the space in general. Okay, um, in your opinion, what will come first, retail or institutional attention? And what could be done to facilitate it? This is also from Dr. Bitcoin. Um, so I think both will come, but I think I think the institutions are important, right? Because I think for two reasons, right? Institutions bring in, you know, institutions aggregate capital, right? So just from a time and the return standpoint, like get institutions in, and you're getting a lot of capital into your economy. Right, but institutions are also a signaling mechanism, right? People see institutions coming that they know, brands that they've used all their lives, like playing a role or participating, and it signals to them that it's okay. Like it's actually, you know, when, when a PayPal gets into crypto, right, how many millions of Americans reading articles today about PayPal are like, oh, wait, PayPal's getting into crypto? Like, I have a PayPal account I haven't used in a long time, like, I had to go dust it off and figure out why I should be, like, why, if they're interested, like, why shouldn't I be, right? And so, like, regardless of, you know, how many users come through PayPal, just the idea that one of the biggest financial institutions in the United States um, is now going into the space in a very big way, it signals to, like, everyone in retail to say, well, like, all those kids using Robinhood apps and, like, speculating on stocks, like, they're like, well, I could, you know, Shucks, like <laughs> PayPal is playing in the space. Like maybe I should pay more attention there, right? People are not, you know, so for me, it's, I think institutions are very important as signaling mechanisms because still today, right? People default to institutions they trust as venues that they go to transact, right? If a bank of America or a bank is now saying, hey, you can buy a stable coin, right? I think the CFTC said like banks can now custody stable coins, right? So if your bank says, hey, you can have a dollar account, but oh, you can have this like, I don't know, USDC account or USDT account. And you can use that to go kind of get interest, some yeah, interest bearing. <laughs> right. Like, wouldn't you do that? If your bank opened up a USDT account for you and said you can open an account and get 7%, or you could just hold your dollars and get pretty much zero. Yeah. How many people will subscribe to that? And I don't right. understand how people don't see like it here in the United States. I'm like, I talk to my mom about it every day. I'm like, look, your money's sitting in this. You're not even getting 1%. It's all because the FDIC insurance. That's what they're all about here. And that's what they freak out about. But I'm like, you just move your money to Gemini, those same dollars, and you're going to just get 8% now. Like it's, it's not that difficult. Yeah. And, and you think about it, right? And no one is saying coming on yield farm and take all this like massive risk. Like you could put your money in regulated entities, right? You can open a Coinbase account and get yield on some of the assets that allow you to get yield on. Like that's not a huge leap, right? And and so I think it's just familiarity, right? Lots of people, like in as much as we think Coinbase is a household name in crypto, most Americans have never heard of Coinbase. Like what is it? Like they've heard, I mean, more Americans have heard of PayPal than Coinbase, I guarantee you that. And more Americans have heard of Bank of America, JP Morgan, Citi, and they've heard of PayPal, right? So if all of a sudden, like, their institutions are familiar with are now saying it's okay, then you, 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 break, you, you jump past that, like, th trust threshold. Like, the average person, like, trusts institutions they know, they know what they know, and they stay there. Like, the average person is not this high-risk taker trying the next new thing. Like, that's not how the adoption curve works. Like, you come out, you almost have to come to where they are and service them there. And show them like, hey, this looks like what you already have. It does a few better things, but like bottom line, it will make you more money. Okay, great. And from there, they start asking questions. 
well, okay, if I can make more money here, then can I make more money by going to Coinbase? Because Coinbase seems to be the institution that, we've, that everyone talks about in crypto. Like, can I, like, and they'll start kind of, the adventurous people start kind of walking that walk and now realize that, oh, you know, maybe I'm more comfortable playing in DeFi directly because I have the skills, you know, I've, I have the risk tolerance. Like, but they, you have to start where people can access something, right? And they start going down the rabbit hole that way. I think that anyone who probably got into crypto, save for like the folks that were like really, really early and, and Mt. Gox and stuff like that, like they probably access crypto in the U.S. through Coinbase first or Kraken. And, you know, at some point, you know, I moved to Binance when Binance was wide open because a lot of the new listings during the last bull run were in Binance. Like, and so, like, and that's how, like, a lot of people's paths sort of happened. And at some point, a few years down the line, you're kind of like, you know, yield farming and doing all sorts of esoteric things, but that's not where you started, right? So I think it's just being aware of that and, and realizing that, you know, you can't really force like, people, people's behavior. Behavior change is hard and you kind of need to start with baby steps. And I think that's where institutions become very, very valuable. Um, that's a little bit long winded, but. No, that, that was, that was perfect. I, um, what one thing you said there, I thought about, I don't know if you saw or if you know of or follow Willie Wu, who's also a, a decred supporter. Um, yep. he tweeted, the other day that presently 2.4 percent of the world population are hodlers of bitcoin we are now broaching the early adopter phase in this nice little chart and it was just interesting to think about like we're still so early and to get like those people who like you said they need those big institutions before they're like oh like bank of america has you know gusd now you know whatever it is and um uh back to these questions sorry i can also get long-winded Geostone, he said, I want to see the Holy Grail, fiat to decred gateway with an with an anonymity. I can't speak. I think it's probably impossible, but that would be ideal in my opinion. What are your thoughts on that? Um I mean that'd be great. I'd love to see that too. Um there's probably a pathway to do that, but I don't know if you get full and I don't know if you get anonymity, right? I don't it's like there's like there's a compromise that has to be made. Um, you know, that, you know, whoever's coming in through some sort of a fiat gateway, uh, um, is, is giving up some information, right? So if you're moving money from your bank to Coinbase, um, there's all this information as to who you are, where it's coming from. And maybe that's okay, right? It is what it is. But once you're in, right, the ecosystems, you can get all those assurances, right? And I think ultimately part of the, ch the tension is, you know, most, most countries like the United States want, want people to pay their taxes, right? And they, they want to make sure that whatever people are doing in the crypto ecosystem, they're paying taxes, and they also want to make sure nefarious actors are not leveraging it to break the law, right? And that's reasonable, right? I don't, like, I want privacy. I want all these assurances, but I'm not trying to break the law. I'm not trying to skirt the rules. Like, I just want to be able to participate and have free, like, access, right? And all the assurances that my constitutional rights give to me, right? So I think it's kind of, one has to be pragmatic and realize that if you're going to want to have those on-ramps, there's certain compromises you have to make, right? You can secure your privacy. You can leverage institutions you use today that you trust, right? And you can use that as a way to transition in. But, like, there's no, there's, I mean... There's no way you're going to have, in my view, like fully permissionless everything. And like I can onboard and keep my dollars. Like it, it just, there'll be data you have to share. So I think it's either you compromise on that level or you figure out other ways to do it, right? Leveraging stable coins, for example, as a means for people to do that. And, you know, making it a little more, you know, people have to make a few more hops. But, you know, if you want more privacy and you want more anonymity, then there's more compromises that they, oh, there it makes it a little more complex in terms of what solutions you can offer he has another question he says i would also like to see some custodial services rolled out for those that may feel more comfortable that way um what are your thoughts on more custodial services yeah and so to me that sounds to me like apps or dApps right that's that's like someone comes builds a dap on top of like, so look at Politea as an example, right? Politea is a great governance mechanism, right? You can 
you know, you can put in proposals, you can access funding, you can build things that help the deep credit ecosystem, right? But Politeno could also be used by a third party that forks the code, um, you know, is hashing information onto DCR time. So you have this assurance that the information is hashed to our blocks, it's retrievable, it can, it can be manipulated. But someone might take that and say, look, I'm going to build a governance as a service platform. And I'm going to put a UX and UI. I'll charge people US dollars to use it. You know, a company, a cooperative, a group of people, you know, a, um, a PTA, like any kind of coordinating mechanism where people have to discuss things, put up proposals, spend money, any collective, like Politeria can serve those purposes, right? And ultimately, if we create an, make it easy for people to build and use it, and what we're getting as a community is a use case and people literally hashing information into our blocks, that's a win-win, right? That doesn't compromise you know, the de decred blockchain in any way, and it still creates a way for someone to take this technology, build something that is potentially more user-friendly, and get paid doing it. Like, to me, that's, that's great. Like, you can have a fund, or a VC fund, or a fund that says, hey, I have five partners or five principals, and we're raising money independently, and we have our fund in US dollars or whatever currency, and all we want is a coordination mechanism. Like, I don't want, I didn't want, to, I don't want DCR. I don't even want to get into crypto. Like, I just want the tool. Like, why not? Right? Why not create that as a way that you have a much better coordination tool that is tamper resistant, where information is verifiable, people can't change history, right? All those assurances you get from a timestamp system. Like, to me, it's like, to me, that's a no brainer. Like, that's like, that's an application that we use in Decred today that can be used hundreds and thousands of ways if we just create an avenue for people to be able to see and recognize what it is um, and interact with it. So I, I agree. I think you know, allowing people to build custodial services more, you know, and proactively going after people like that makes a lot of sense because that might be the first way. That, that's, a custodial service is the way that the majority of the mass market will interact with crypto first. Period. There's just no two ways about that, right? Um, if you, you want the mass market, wait, wait, I'm sorry. You said what will be the first way they interact? I had some sort of a custodial service. Okay. So okay. whether it's a tool that someone has forked and is now charging people for, whether it's like a coin-based type system that you know it's not really your coins if it's not your, you know, your keys or whatever. Let well, me ask you another question. Do you think it's possible that there will be some people? Do you think it's possible that people will interact with, because I have not done enough thinking about DCR time, clearly from things that you're talking about, and I think I need to do that, but is it possible that people interact with a tool such as DCR time before they interact with a custodial service of actually holding crypto, do you think, or no? Potentially, right? Because, it's, see, everything has utility value. Right? A currency has utility value for very specific reasons. A tool has utility value. Right? And so, like, if you were to approach like, a, an established regulated company today and say, you know, take some of your treasury, so like MicroStrategy did, take some of your treasury and buy Decred. Right? If, if you approach them and said, they know nothing about crypto, they've never bought Bitcoin, they've never, you know, they're just like, I've heard about it, but I know nothing about it. Are they more likely to buy DCR from my first interaction with you? Or are they more likely to use a nice looking interface and you tell them that, look, you guys spend a lot of inordinate time trying to coordinate between decision making. It's not clear who owns the decision. What if I gave you this cool tool where you guys can have your own world garden, right? your own version of, of Politea, you can have your proposal system. You can have people talking and discussing things. Then ultimately, everyone votes based on the voting mechanism you've created. Is it one-to-one -one vote? Is it based on authority? Like they can customize it any way they want. But ultimately, they have a system that's transparent where I, if you voted one way today, you can't tell me two years from now that you voted a different way because it's on-chain and it's verifiable. Like to me, that becomes much easier to sell like to someone than to sell them, what is Decred? What is Bitcoin? Like, you're selling them basically a tool they can use that, especially in this time when we have, you know, coronavirus and people working, you know, remote workers, and like, it's even a bigger opportunity to sell these sort of like virtual coordination tools, right? And you just package it in a way that people can use it. 
Um, you know, and for all they know, it's just some cool database that lets me like retrieve information. I know no one can tamper with it. Like to me, that's a much easier access point that a lot of people would understand and might be able to use. So we don't necessarily have to build it. We got to find. We got to attract the folks that will go build that thing and then go sell it because they know how to sell it. I don't know how to sell it. I don't need to know how to sell it. I need to sell it to the guy who says, "Oh, this is a better. This is a better database architecture for what I want to do than you know a traditional like Oracle database, right? For all sorts of reasons. So you know what? I'll use that instead. And if there's some way to have a treasury that might subsidize the building of that, even better, yeah. right? You're going to subsidize my cost because it's a win-win. Right, that's what we need to bring in and attract, and we need to do that proactively because other projects are doing that. Right, and and um, that's just you know, that's just my my view in the world. No, I agree with it. I I like what you're saying. Um, this last question from the community, I think we kind of already answered earlier, but he says. I'd like to know more about your theory about the quote lack of interest in the project. My quote, I said that. I, I that's what I that's what I, I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what. Sure, I mean, but I, yeah, I, could, I could talk to. I mean, I could talk to that. I probably did say it. Um, so I think that. So I mean, just this is just based on my personal experience, right? I've been involved with Decred Committee for over two years, and you know, actively for like. I'd say a good like 16, 18 months, like, you know, when I was quite active day to day, you know, and in many ways I had a lot of like independence and in kind of the roles I had, you know, doing a lot of PR, traveling to events, um, you know, trying to build awareness in Africa. Like I kind of was like a one man show and just coordinated with other parties as needed. And so I, I had some level of like independence. But when I kind of look back, you know, and just, and I was, you know, I made my own time and my own work and was, you know, I could fill my own time and I was busy. But when I look back, I sort of like reflect, you know, Decode is a hard place to, so from the standpoint of a contributor, it's actually a hard place or it's a, one of the more challenging places to get paid to contribute, right? And I mean that like, so let me put it this way, right? If you're going to get a traditional job and get a traditional interview, like it's a process, right? You interview, you either make it or you're not. Claire, you know, if I didn't get into, if I didn't get the job, I move on, right? In Decred, you sort of have to show up into the community. You have to kind of get to learn some of the, you know, unwritten rules and the norms. You have to be bought into the process. That's great. It's a good filtering mechanism. Um, but then it's like um, you now have to interact with a culture that may or may not be open to your ideas, right? So you either kind of narrow your view to kind of fit in or you be who you are and you kind of get a lot of friction points, right? And, and becomes potentially an uncomfortable place. And at some point it breaks, right? You, you, you kind of, if the majority or a good majority of contractors are kind of like in one camp and you kind of, then something's got to give, right? Now, for me, if you're going to scale contributors like to the extent that we need to, to make Decred ultimately successful, the current system is not working, right? You have to make it more structured. So it's like almost like a job job, or you have to be a lot more open as people show up with all these ideas to make it a lot easier for people to leverage the tools, right? So you might say, oh, Politea is there. Like, we should just put out proposals. Like, it's not that intuitive for someone who's not, versed with crypto might not like it's not it's not as intuitive as we might think being insiders right so how do you you know and and we've had incidences in the past where people stood up and put proposals in politea and because they didn't do things the right way or they made some sort of errors like it's like the community was harsh it was almost kind of like you should know better or you should know how to use it. it's like no like that's not a welcoming environment i've been in other communities where people show up and it's like they're making mistakes left right and center but People are like holding their hand and saying, oh, we're, we're happy you're here. Like, sure, like, you know, it's not like a hard slap on the wrist. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, go take it to this channel. So I think it's just being more welcoming. And if you're not, then it's just going to be, you know, this small, really quality group of people, and it's not really going to grow, right? And there'll be a treasury that funds a lot of activities. You can stretch that treasury for as long as you want, but you're only going to be so successful. 
especially in light of the fact that other competing communities are don't have that hang up, right? And they'll solve for the things that Decred has that they don't. They'll solve for governance, right? They'll solve for having some sort of a treasury mechanism that works. They'll like those things will get solved. Like there's value there, they'll be solved, right? Um, and at some point, you know, if we don't kind of you know, we structure, for lack of a better word, you know, three years from now, like a lot of things will look like decred and a better manifestation of decred. And decred will be the same old decred. And it will be a shame, right? Because the potential was there for a long time. And, you know, there's a window of opportunity that, you know, we could miss. Um, yeah. So let this be a call to action to all. And I, I can agree with you in terms of, well, in my experience has been someone who has just shown up, you know, for the community. Um, so this is actually going to be my plug to tell everyone listening. If you like this episode, drop a tip because I don't do this from the treasury. I do this just because I like decred. And I'm saying this just to say that part of the reason I haven't even tried to go to the treasury is just feeling like, well, one, I'm in law school and um, I don't know, just this, there is there is a disconnect i think in terms of i like what you're the critique about you know i look at a community like polka dot that kind of solves for that issue of being able to have like people who come and apply to build something on top of your blockchain and i don't know just the like you said getting the job and it really does come down to like you said we are at this very unique moment where we have to attract talent and we have to find ways to get people to be incentivized to keep building on the things that the blockchain already has um so let this be a call to action to all i i want to close just by you know asking you to say a little bit about uh, Felimen and what you're doing there and also how people can get in contact with you and um yeah anything else that's on your mind anything else that you just want to say yeah, so people can reach me on, on Twitter. So it's Akin Sawyer. That's my handle. You know, that's that's the town square of crypto, crypto Twitter. So I'm there. Um, what was the other, what's the first half of your question? Um, anything you'd like to say about, you know, what you're doing at Fenleyman? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So Fenleyman is just basically like that's that's my vehicle that I use to interact in the crypto space, right? So, um Originally, Fellman was set up more as a sort of an advisory consulting type entity. Um, but it's the way I kind of contracted to Decred. So lots of contractors just have an LLC or as individuals. So Fellman is hiring contracted to Decred. But it's basically the vehicle I just use in the space to interact. Um, I, don't, I, I, haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time like updating my website, but people could go there as well. Um, there's some content there. Um, like, yeah, for me, like, I'm at the point where I'm just, I have a lot of interests, right? I think there are a lot of interesting projects that I contribute to on a part-time basis, and I'll just continue to do that. It's just a much more, to me, it's a much more interesting space. It's more my temperament, right, yeah, to be yeah. involved in a few things. And, like, you know, on any given day, I could be, you know, in the synthetics community. I could be in Bombridge. I could be in the Ren community. Um, and now, so I started getting into Polkadot, too. It's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I have, I know people who are there building things and relationships there. So I'm beginning to learn like kind of really what a lot of the buzz is about Polkadot. And, um, you know, I think it's really interesting. I think, I think a lot of the layer twos, oh, sorry, a lot of the um, Ethereum killers. <laughs> like as yeah, the generation three is what I think I hear a lot. Of yeah, the yeah the, 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 but I think there's a lot of interesting like experimentation happening in the space. And it's just interesting to see how, you know, what these new things are and what new, kind of like what new things can one do and you know, what the incentives are and how does it improve on coordination mechanisms? Like, you know, it, it's clear that I think some of these protocols have learned from the past and are trying to build and solve coordination problems that have always existed, right? And we'll be interested to see how successful some of them are. And I think, I think there will be multiple smart contract protocols that are successful. Like, I think Ethereum is... It's hard to see like Ethereum being dethroned in any way, but I think you'll have a couple others that, especially the interoperability, that do things in a unique way, and then you can bridge into other chains, right? So they'll live like Ethereum, you know, and people with Ether can go play in Polkadot. Like, I think to me, that's what the world should look like. Like, I should be able to have 
and specialized change the world we're going to that's the world we're going to it's like it's like not even what it's going to look like it's like it's to me it's it's objectively how it's happening right yeah and you can't I mean, yeah you, you can't you can't you can't, you can't like push against the tide right you kind of flow with it and kind of see how it manifests but and to me that's that's what innovation is right that's what makes this place interesting and exciting like there's always something new and it's what makes it fun at least for me to be interacting in the space 100 percent agreed yep well uh keen uh thank you very much for your time uh Everyone, you know how to get in contact with him, and I'll have things in the description uh, so that they can do that as well. Uh, cool, man. Thanks a lot. Take care. Cheers.